so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. The following episode contains discussions of violence. Listener discretion is advised. It's Australia Day 1963, in the middle of a hot summer in Perth. A couple are sitting in a car, kissing and talking, in the beachside suburb of Cottesloe. They feel safe. It's a safe neighbourhood in a safe city, and the night is still and empty. That is, until the female notices, at around 2.40am, something outside the car window. It's a man, watching them. She alerts her male companion to the figure, who they realise is holding a rifle. They spring to action, trying to drive away as fast as they can. The man shoots at them, and she instinctively puts up her hand. She is injured, but the two escape alive. By the next morning, Perth wakes up to the news that five people have been shot, with three dead. It was a killing spree unlike anything Perth had ever seen. But that wouldn't be the extent of the night caller's crimes. And while he killed innocent civilians, there were two men in prison serving time for murders they had not committed. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Tom Meadmore, director of the Stan original documentary series, After the Night. I want to begin with Penny Berkman. It's January 1959 and she goes on a date with a man she's seeing. What happens later on that night? So Penny Berkman, also known as Penina, but for the sake of this Penny Berkman, after her date with her boyfriend, they both go back to her apartment. They make love. He leaves. He lives not far away. And shortly after she falls asleep, an intruder breaks into her apartment in South Perth and starts rummaging about trying to steal change, valuables, anything that he can get his hands on, and startles her. And once startled, this man attacks. He happens to have a diving knife on his uh, persons, which he had collected earlier in the evening, and Penny puts up quite a fight, but he overpowers her and stabs her twice with the diving knife once through the nose and once through the chest. The next morning on the way to work, Penny's boyfriend, whose name is Fotus Hontus, a prominent radio DJ in Perth at the time, was driving to work on his usual route past Penny's apartment. He noticed the door was open and the windows were open, which is really, really unusual. He goes inside and he finds her lying on the floor halfway between her bedroom and the the living room, bleeding out on the floor, gasping for breath. She wasn't dead, uh, but she was just about, and uh, uh, she'd been trying to reach the telephone. Was the boyfriend ever questioned? Did police suspect that he might have something to do with it? She did die shortly after he arrived. Police obviously were on the scene, quick smart, and soon after the police began their investigations, he became their prime suspect. And when they interviewed him, did he have an alibi? Did it become clear that he hadn't been involved? Well, no, actually, he had been with her the night before. There were witnesses to attest to the fact that he had been with her all night and there was no way to account for his whereabouts between, uh, well, around the time that the police ascertained she had passed away or had been attacked. So the thing was for police in those days was that more often than not, generally speaking, if someone was killed, it was the person closest to them. 
So the boyfriend or a family member was always the prime suspect. And in this case, her boyfriend, a foreigner, a Greek man, all of their their theory and suspicion pointed straight to him. Was he ever arrested in relation to this case? He was pressured a great deal by the police to confess. Uh, However, he never confessed to it and the police weren't able to actually get enough evidence to convict him before Photos fled for Greece. It ruined the whole saga, ruined his career, ruined his life in Perth, and he he ended up getting on a plane going back to Greece. And so once that had happened, the police announced to the public, there's nothing to be afraid of. The man that we believe is responsible has left the country and, you know, fleeing for Greece was to them an admission of guilt as it was. So that was, as far as the police were concerned, case closed. Whereabouts did Penny Berkman live in Perth? Mm-hmm. Can you give us a bit of an overview for those of us who who aren't from Perth of the sort of dynamics and, you know, there's the western suburbs and that's sometimes considered, you know, a more like upper class area. What are the dynamics of, of Perth at this time? Perth is a, on a whole, it's a country town. It's vibrant, colourful, very friendly and extremely community orientated. People are good, honest, hardworking, true blue people. However, the class system did exist. And Benita Berkman, uh, who was actually originally from the Eastern States, uh, she was from Melbourne, she lived in the south of Perth. And the south of Perth was not as affluent as other suburbs such as the western suburbs. And the western suburbs are Claremont, Peppermint Grove, Cottesloe, Nedlands. They're the wealthy affluent suburbs, which is actually where uh, my parents grew up. Not that we were wealthy, but they were lucky enough to live there. And so the people on that side of town, while it was shocking that Penny Berkman was murdered and the way she was murdered frightened everybody, south of Perth where she lived was a long way away from these parts of town and there was a huge river that separated them as well. So it felt like, you know, she's she's not one of us, she's from the other side of the country and she lives on the other side of the city, so we're okay. So the people in the western suburbs, as you say, felt as though it was a while from them and and they were kind of safe. Yeah. And that was until nine months later when Gillian Brewer was asleep in her bed. What happens to her? So nine months later, another woman is attacked in her bed. She's brutally, brutally murdered. The intruder has a small hatchet and beats her over the head with it, across her body quite violently. And when realises she hasn't died, he finds some scissors and stabs her in various parts of her body with the scissors as well, which still doesn't kill her and it actually takes a very long time for her to die as well. It's really horrific. Like Penny, she's a single woman. She had a male lover that night and she was living alone. And this murder blew up. It absolutely just, it, it, everyone's anxiety just blew up again. But the difference with this murder was it wasn't in the south of Perth this time. It was in the heart of the western suburbs in Cottesloe. So the wealthy, affluent part of town, it was like a direct hit to their sense of security. And everyone freaked out. Everyone panicked. It was just a massive shock to the system. Did police have any leads? Where did they start in terms of finding who might have been responsible for this? Well, the police followed the same protocol they did with Penny Berkman. They interviewed neighbours, they interviewed family, they interviewed partners. She did have a boyfriend and he was the man that she'd been with that night and he had an alibi though, uh, so he was ruled out. And after fairly extensive investigations led by super cop Owen Leach, I mean top, top detective, you know, cannot fault this mad detective. The investigations went nowhere, in fact. There was no clues, no leads, nothing, which generated enormous anxiety within the community of the Western suburbs especially. How did police come up with the name Daryl Beamish? It had been about a year and there'd been no leads, nothing. 
So because the, the forensics had actually identified certain parts of the stabbings suggested that there was sexual undertone in this particular murder. So the police thought, okay, let's branch out, uh, let's interview sex offenders. And you have to bear in mind, this is a year after the murder. Owen Leach comes across in court a bloke by the name of Daryl Raymond Beamish, who's in court for a sex offence. And Owen Leach's senses just sort of went off and he started to question this kid and asked him flat out, have you ever been to Brookwood Flats, which is the name of the flats where Gillian Brewer lived? And Beamish said, yes, actually, I have been to Brookwood Flats. And the moment this happened, Owen Leach just set off and he became their prime suspect. Had police dismissed the possibility that these two cases were linked? Because obviously they were in different suburbs. As you say, it felt like a world away. But there are some similarities in that they were two women asleep in their own houses alone when they'd been killed. Was it ever brought up that these might be, you know, the crimes of the same man? There was actually a few people who drew comparisons to the two crimes. There were similarities to the way that the woman was stabbed and killed. And then reporters started, one in particular, Jack Coulter for the Daily News, drew a whole series of comparisons. You know, woman, just been with her partner, was naked, was in a ground floor flat. There was a breaking and entering and they just made love. So there was a sense of, well, this, it feels like this is, these are connected, these crimes are connected, but the police, Detective Sergeant Brett Burrows was the, uh, one of the lead detectives. He uh, got on television, he said, look, you know, it's nothing to worry about because Fotis Hunters, Penina Berkman's boyfriend, he's gone. He, he's responsible for that and he's gone. So there's no way he could have killed Gillian Brewer and he's gone. The, the public trusted the police, so they were confident in that. What became of Daryl Beamish? So they found him, they've questioned him. There's an officer who's pretty convinced that they've got their man and, as you say, they wanted the public to feel safer, to feel as though the person who was responsible for this had been arrested. Were they able to find evidence? What did Daryl say? Well, this is, the, this is the incredible thing is that actually shortly after they apprehended Daryl Beamish for questioning, they took him to the flats and he basically admitted to the crime straight up. You know, Owen Leach, he walked him through the crime scene, asked him a series of questions about, well, you know, have you been here? Have you been in this house? Have you come into this bedroom? Have you ever seen this bed before? And to all these questions, Daryl Beamish responded, yes. And, you know, when he was asked, did he have sex with the woman? He said, yes. He was asked if he had blood on him at the time. And he said, yes, I did. And they asked him, what did you do with the murder weapon? And he pointed to the fence, which is where it was found. And so basically confessed. And, you know, <laughs> Owen Leach was wrapped. Everyone was wrapped and very pleased. And he went straight to court. He was found guilty of murder. And actually, he was going to be hung, but his sentence was commuted and was given life imprisonment. So police have put a bit of a line under both of those crimes and feel as though they've solved them. And then it's Australia Day 1963, and a young couple are sitting in a car outside the Cottesloe Civic Centre having a drink together. What did the woman, Rowena, see that night? So those first two murders were 1959. It was four years later, well, just over, th just over three years later, you should say, just, you know, between three and four years later. Perth's cracking on as normal. Everyone's happy. Everyone's living their best life, you know, running around in hot, sunny Perth. And, you know, it's not a care of the world. And then on 26th of January 1963, it's Australia Day. It's a particularly hot night. And about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, there's a couple who are having some fun in a car in Cottesloe and they're kissing and canoodling. And then suddenly Rowena, she sees something off in the bushes just off the side of the road and out steps this figure with a gun. And she immediately sees that it's a gun and starts screaming. And the man with her is a fellow by the name of Nick August. He immediately fumbles and tries to get the car started, but he can't. And this figure lets off a round and shoots them. But she manages to sort of push him out of the way and the bullet just scrapes the side of his neck and hits her in the hand and they speed off and manage to escape any further injury. What did that gunman do next? 
So that wasn't the end of things that night. Just around the corner, maybe two, three hundred metres away, there was an apartment building and this gunman walked to the apartment building and found a young man by the name of Brian Weir asleep just on the edge of his bedroom where the porch was because, as I said, it's an extremely hot night and the door was open. And this gunman just basically walked up to him, took aim with his rifle and shot him straight point blank in the head. This particular man didn't die straight away. He bled profusely and was taken to hospital the next morning when he was found and lived for a couple of years with extremely severe brain injuries until he died of those injuries a couple of years later. How many people were killed that night? The gunman then went over to another suburb in Nedlands, which is the next suburb along, and shot two more people. Another man by the name of John Sturkey sleeping on his back veranda, shot him point blank range in the head as he lay there. And then the other one, which is what I learnt this story on, my mum told me about the man who answered the door in the middle of the night. Someone knocked on the door and he answered it. And as he stepped outside to see who it was, boom, someone just shot him in the head. Mum told me that story when I was about eight and terrified me. And that's what sort of got me onto this. And yeah, so overall that night there were five people shot, three of which were killed. And it turned the city upside down. I mean, suddenly this secure, happy, fun life summer city turned into chaos of fear, suspicion. Everyone's lives were just totally turned upside down. What have your mum and dad said about what the atmosphere was like and what they did to sort of change how they lived? Because as you say, I mean, even now you can understand in summer leaving a window open, leaving a door open, it's hot, you feel, most of us feel incredibly safe. How did their behaviour change after those events in 1963? Suddenly overnight, everyone was just terrified because of the randomness of all these crimes, because there was no pattern. You know, everyone was different. Each victim was just completely different. Everyone felt, well, I could be next. And so suddenly this culture in Perth, which was leave the doors unlocked, the only way to get air conditioning in those days was to leave the windows wide open and wait for the evening, cool evening breeze in Perth is known as the Fremantle Doctor. People would sleep out on the back lawns, you know, when it was particularly hot. Suddenly all of this just went out the window. Suddenly all of the doors were locked. Everyone brought their mattresses in from the back lawn and back verandas and slept inside. The windows were shut. My grandfather nailed the window shut in my dad's bedroom and was were like that until they sold the house. My grandfather at my mum's place, they put bars on the windows. Stinking hot summer, 40 degree heat, and everyone was trapped inside. No one would go out after dark and everyone was just staring into the shadows at night time, absolutely petrified. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with Tom Meadmore, director of the Stan original documentary series, After the Night. So there's enormous pressure to find out who has done this to the community. And then in 1963, there's another crime, which seems, again, almost unrelated. And it happens after a man named John Button has had an argument with his girlfriend, Rosemary Anderson. How does that night end? So two weeks later, there's another killing, basically. John Button, 19-year-old British kid who's immigrated to Australia. It's his birthday has a massive argument with his girlfriend, Rosemary Anderson, and she takes off and he chases after her because, you know, he's trying to make up, apologise, but at some point he uh, loses sight of her and eventually when he catches up to her, she's there lying in the sand bleeding to death and immediately there's a big question mark over who did this. He then takes her to get help. That's his number one priority. I can imagine he's in pretty significant shock. And police, understandably, question him and wonder if he's got something to do with it. They then 
inspect his car, is there any indication that he is potentially guilty of running her over? Well, the first thing that happens is the police, when they uh, see him, they're immediately suspicious of him because he's nervous, he's stuttering, he's freaking out, he's not giving them straight answers. They inspect his car and when they inspect his car, things go very badly because the bumper of his car is damaged, the grill on the car is damaged, the headlight is damaged, there's blood on the bonnet and there's a ripple on the bonnet roughly the size of a head. As soon as this is discovered, they are certain that this is a clear-cut case of a boyfriend and a girlfriend having an argument and boyfriend loses his temper, runs her down. Does he have an explanation for why his car looks like that or might be damaged? He tells the police that he got into an accident a couple of weeks before, which has resulted in the headlight and the grill being damaged. But he can't account for the blood. He can't account for the dent in the top of the bonnet about the same size as a head. So he is interrogated and police are pretty certain that they've got their person. What does he say? Is he able to defend himself? As you say, he's 19 years old and he's just experienced something pretty traumatic. What happens during that interrogation? The police basically are fairly certain that John is responsible. But when they ask him, he denies it and he continues to deny it. But the police have got this evidence. It's pretty clear to them that he's lying. And so they persist. And according to John, they push and push and push and push to the point where they start getting physical and beating him up. Because, you know, police, they can tell a liar when they see one and this guy's clearly a liar. They've done this a million times. They, you know, don't waste our time kind of thing. And they persist, which is what the culture was. And eventually, of course, he cracks and he signs a confession. So he is found guilty of killing his girlfriend and he is imprisoned for that. And once he is in jail, something happens in August 1963, which is that someone finds a rifle and then police decide to set up a bit of a trap to see if someone might come back and claim this rifle that they seem to have just discarded on the street. What happens? Does the trap work? So it's kind of a a miracle, actually, because the police couldn't find this shooter. There was no clues, no evidence, absolutely nothing, and the city was just up in arms about it, freaking out because, you know, (laughs) there's this killer on the loose. However, by August, you know, the shootings happened in January, by August things had calmed down a bit and people had started to relax just a little bit here and there. And after the incident in August that you've just referred to, there's a couple, an elderly couple, are walking home and they come across this rifle in a bush. The police come and get it through forensics, ascertain it is the rifle that has killed the most recent victim. Not the victims in January, but the most recent victim. So they decide, okay, we're going to set up a little trap. They put a fake replica rifle back in its place, attach it with a big fishing line, a a nine-pound fishing line, and wait. They set up tent and wait. But, of course, no one comes back to get it. They wait and they wait and they wait and no one's coming for it. So the detectives think, okay, we need to to try and do something about this. So they work with the journalists, the police roundsmen for the Daily News and the West Australian newspapers and give them carte blanche to basically write whatever they want as long as it's, of course, the public don't know that this rifle has been found. They are allowed to write whatever they want as long as it is geared toward driving the killer back to get the rifle. So one of the journalists says that this big fingerprinting operation, which is what the police were doing in an attempt to try and find a clue of some sort, they said, oh, they're going to move our fingerprinting operation to this area in the next couple of days where the rifle was found. And the hope was the killer would read this article and think, gosh, if there's going to be police swarming the area, maybe they'll come across this rifle, which could be incriminating for me. I better go and get it. 
And sure enough, a couple of days later, after the article was released, a car shows up in the middle of the night and the two detectives watching the space wait just on tender hooks to see if it's someone who's going to be going for the rifle. And sure enough, this bloke gets out, walks over to the bush, kneels down to get the rifle and these two cops pounce on him. They catch him. They catch the shooter. It's a, it's a miracle. It was a real miracle, actually. How would you describe this man who they apprehend? His name is Eric Edgar Cook. What does he look like? Does he have a family? What's his life like? Eric Cook is a truck driver. He lives in South Perth. He has a family of seven children and a wife. He is short, black hair, and he has a a speech impediment, so he mumbles. He then denies it and tries to talk his way out of it. Eventually, police are able to get him to confess. And he does start to confess as a pretty clever police officer who finds a way to get that out of him. But then he starts to confess to running down Rosemary Anderson. And of course, there's already someone in jail for that crime. He walked them through the series of events that happened that night. Were his series of events accurate? Did police believe his story that he was in fact the man responsible for that crime? After he was caught, he confessed to a whole host of of crimes. And among those crimes, he confessed to killing Rosemary Anderson. However, when the police took him out to the site where Rosemary was run down, they asked Eric Cook to give them the details of what had happened, how did it occur, etc. And Eric Cook got some details wrong. And it immediately made the police think, well, this bloke's lying. He's trying to delay proceedings, so, you know, because he was facing the death penalty. He's trying to delay proceedings. He's trying to throw us off course. He's trying to make life difficult for us. So, no, they didn't believe him. And John is, of course, I think he's on death row by that point for the murder of his girlfriend. And he says, although he has signed a confession, he says he hasn't done it. And so he gets the news that someone has confessed. And then I think by sundown, Eric Cook has taken away his confession. How about those two other murders? Of course, we've got Penny Berkman, and they believe that it's the man who's gone overseas. And Daryl Beamish is in jail for the murder of Gillian Brewer. Does Eric Cook ever confess to those two murders? Well, so among the confessions that Cook makes on top of Rosemary Anderson, Cook also confesses to the murder of Penina Berkman and he confesses to the murder of Gillian Brewer. And so within this period of time, the police are trying to ascertain just what this man is responsible for. They take him to Penina's flat and he walks the police through the crime in minute detail, so much so that they have to accept that Cook is the one responsible for Penina Berkman. And so they accept that confession. However, they walk him through the crime scene at Gillian Brewer's flat and he makes a few mistakes and doesn't convince them that he's responsible for Gillian Brewer at all. And so they believe he's lying about that one and throw that out. So do police think that he's almost bragging and that he's taking credit for crimes that he hasn't committed? Fundamentally, the police believe that this man is just trying to make a big name for himself, that he is facing the death penalty and he's trying to expand his reputation as much as he can to leave a bigger legacy. So they write off those crimes. So there are three men over these crimes who face the death penalty. Eric Cook is the only one who is actually killed. What did he say right before he died? His final words before he walked into the gallows was he swore by Almighty God to the priest that he did, in fact, kill Gillian Brewer and Rosemary Anderson. When there was nothing left for him to gain, he kept that story going. And yet John is still in prison saying that he hasn't committed this crime. He serves many years. What was the role of journalist Estelle Blackburn when it came to 
John Button. What did she decide to do? John served five years for manslaughter in the end was what he was convicted of with Rosemary, eventually was released. And in the 90s, by chance, Estelle Blackburn met John's brother who told her his brother had been framed. She didn't believe it, but she dug into it anyway out of curiosity. And soon after she thought that John was innocent, she found new evidence that confirmed this for her and started to pursue it as a passion to uh, clear John's name. Because for John, clearing his name was the most important thing because when he even was released from prison, there was still a sense in the community that he was guilty. Was she able to prove that? He was able to again stand trial and attempt to have his name cleared. What kind of evidence did they find when they looked a little more closely? Estelle was given access to police files and she found, in fact, a whole series of other confessions that Cook had made during that period, confessions of running women down, and these were not publicised. She believed suppressed. So to her, she didn't know that Cook had also run women down and these were confessions to hit runs that the police had accepted. And so she suddenly was faced with this question, well, hang on, the police accepted all these other hit runs but they didn't except the hit run on Rosemary Anderson. So what's going on here? This isn't right. And it was on the strength of that evidence that she uncovered, John was granted a new appeal in 2001. And once he does have that new appeal, they're able to look a little bit more closely at the details on the car and whether it's consistent with having run Rosemary down. Were they able to find... Because it's it's such a case of bad luck, I suppose, that he would have had some sort of accident in the weeks leading up to it. Were they able to look a little more closely and see if that was consistent with having run someone over? Was there anything police had missed? So by this point, forensic evidence had advanced quite substantially and Estelle had teamed up with a fellow by the name of Brett Christian who is a a very well-known journalist and newspaper owner in Perth. And Brett believed, okay, we need to bring science into the equation and had the bright idea, well, let's run some car tests. Let's, Let's recreate the car crash and see if we can ascertain whether it was John's car, that type of car that hit Rosemary, or whether it was another type of car, the car that Cook said he was driving that night, and, you know, see if it was actually possible. And through the tests, they were able to irrefutably determine that it was impossible for John's car to have hit Rosemary that night. It was absolutely impossible. Uh, The damage to his car would have been just completely different to the damage that the police discovered on John's car that night. So it was an absolute game changer. There was a team of people who worked on having John's conviction overturned. That same team, when they were successful, started to ask questions about Daryl Beamish, who is still in jail after the murder of Gillian Brewer. What did they discover about his case? Well, by this stage, actually, Daryl Beamish had been released. Daryl Beamish served 10 years. So the legal team and Estelle and Brett basically thought there was another murder that Cook confessed to for whom the man they had in prison also professed his innocence. So let's look into this case. And the big, big piece of evidence that they found actually was within the confessions themselves. Daryl's confession was four pages of very, very basic, light on detail, really quite simple whereas Cook's confession was extensive, 14 pages, very, very meticulously detailed, and it was through this that they were able to gain another appeal for Daryl Beamish, and through that process the lawyers went through, they were able to prove that Daryl was, in fact, innocent of this crime as well, and that was in 2004. Eric was the last man to face the death penalty in Perth, And the case is particularly interesting and horrifying because there were three men who were convicted 
of the crimes of Eric Cook. What did police learn? Were they able to look back at this case and particularly around confessions? I think the average person as well as the police force took confessions at face value. Why would you confess to a crime that you weren't guilty of? Did this inform future police work? Did this change how they did their jobs? I can't speak for how police procedure specifically changed within the police force because the police wouldn't talk to me. However, it did set off a chain of events which led to a Royal Commission and an establishing of the Corruption and Crimes Commission. And this also led to additional witnesses being present within police interview settings. And generally speaking, there was a lot more scrutiny placed on police, I think, with things like body cams, ultimately. And yeah, the, the police are held to a much higher level of scrutiny. However... The problem is wrongful convictions seem to be still going on. And you can look at evidence of that. There's a man by the name of Scott Orstick who was convicted of murdering his girlfriend a number of years ago. And it's just been found evidence was planted by police to get a conviction for Scott. And this evidence recently came out, which resulted in that conviction being thrown out and a whole new trial occurred, which the verdict was delivered on Friday last week. And he's been found completely innocent. So this kind of behaviour still goes on without checks and balances, it seems. So there's an argument to say, yes, police procedures changed and, you know, they're held to higher scrutiny. But on the other hand, an enormous amount of evidence that shows there's nothing has changed. My final question is just how this series of events and crimes, some of the most horrific that police officers ever saw, actually changed Perth. And your parents, you know, were around it at the time of these crimes. How do you think it changed Perth in the long run? I think it traumatised people. It 100% embedded a sense of anxiety in that generation and that group of people. People still meticulously lock doors and windows and fret about security. My mum oh my God, if you go to my mum's house, she will lock the door, even if it's the back door, with six foot a six foot fence protecting you from the street. You walk in and out of the door, she'll lock the door behind you. And constantly I get locked out of the house. Like, I'm not kidding. This is the anxiety that's, that, that still lives on. But then there's, of course, the victims themselves and the families of the victims, the trauma of these events has been passed down from the generations as well. So I think there has been an enormous ripple effect. And while Perth is a sunny, happy, friendly city, it certainly isn't carefree and it certainly doesn't have the innocence and the same sense of trust and community that it once did. Thank you so much for your time, Tom. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Thanks to my guest, Tom Meadmore. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jesse Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our executive producer is Zoe Ferguson. If you'd like to find out more about this show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join.